Amen. All righty. Praise the Lord. Ready. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 7, we'll read verses 1 through 9. Um, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land uh, where you go to possess it, and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, um, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God shall deliver them before you, you shall smite them and utterly destroy them and shall make no covenant with them, nor show them mercy. Neither shall you make marriages with them. Your daughter shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shall thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy you suddenly. Verse 5, But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, and break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he has sworn to your fathers, has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now therefore, I'm sorry, know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, yes. the faithful God, yes. which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. The word of God for the people of God. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord God, today. We thank you once again for this opportunity that you've given us to come before you to sing praise into your great and wonderful name. So, Lord God, to give to you out of what you have so graciously given to us and now to hear your life-transforming word, we ask that you would prepare our hearts to be even good ground now for your word, that you would cause every distraction to be pushed aside, that our focus and attention would be upon you, God. We pray, God, that you give us eyes to see, ears to hear what your spirit has to say to us, courage and wisdom, Lord God, to apply your word to our lives, that your name might be glorified by our living. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. You know, one of the things we should take comfort in as Christians is that uh, we are God's treasured possession. Now, you know, Moses was leading the children of Israel, of course, you know, out of Egypt and into the promised land. And God was doing great and wonderful things. And he reminded them, them of some things as he would, began to defeat the nations for them or give them, get victory for them. And he wanted to remind them that it, was, it would be him that is getting the victory. And when you do, you know, get victory and success and advance in, in life and sometimes in positions that you don't forget God. You don't forget who did it and who you owe Owe, this, owe your uh, your success too, and so God reminds them, and He begins to tell them as in verse one, He told them He says that He's going to bring you into a land where you go. He said you got they got seven nations that are mightier than you, and that you're going to conquer some things that are that are too great for you to conquer. And I think the Lord appoints to them points us out to them that what is going to be accomplished in their lives, they cannot do it on their own. And that's a very real um, thing that we need to keep in mind because things happen in life and, and pe you know, people are quick to pat themselves on the back and, you know, for the things that they've accomplished. And boy, look, you know, and we know, and that's where we get the bragging and, and things like that from. And as Christians, we have nothing to brag, you know, to brag about. I was just listening uh, yesterday uh, to, to the Bible on my phone and uh, Paul was, you know, talking to the Corinthians. He says, you know, what do you have that wasn't given? to you and if it was given to you why are you gonna brag like like it wasn't given to you right that we have nothing to brag about of our own and God wants to remind them of that as he begins to take them into this success and this victory you know and I think what God wanted to produce in them was in gratitude dependency and commitment that they would be grateful that you remain grateful, 
and that you would always continue to depend on God. Because see, sometimes we have a tendency to depend on God when we see the need. But God wants us to understand that we need him equally all the time. Right? That so, so there should be a gratitude that God, you know, would, would open the doors to, to, you know, to his throne, to, to open his ears to me and be able to listen to me and open his windows and, of heaven to pour out blessings upon me. And so we should have gratitude, but we should always depend on him. Like I said, whether things are going great or whether they're going terribly wrong in our lives, we should always depend on him equally because we need him at all times. It's just that sometimes in our lives we have a tendency to, to see it more and what God wants us to do is to, to be people who see the need for him at all times. To understand that things can be going perfectly and that in a moment's notice they could turn and change. And so we need him and we need to be grateful and, and we need to be filled with gratitude and then we should have this commitment to follow him, to stick closely with him. And I was thinking, I thought about this and I said you know, what if you were if you were driving, you know, you and your family were uh, driving and maybe you're going to another city and you ended up in a really bad part of town and in one of these big cities. And it was really a dangerous part of town where you could get carjacked or whatever. And you didn't know, you know, know your way around or how to get out. And you are in this bad part of town and you, you know, you, you pull up to a, a stop sign and you see someone who is an old friend from home or something who's been living out there. And, they, and they're like, look, I follow me and I'll, I'll get you back to the main highway and get you out of this area or something. You know, you, you would be grateful and you would be dependent upon them. Every turn they made, you would make that turn. And you'd be committed to staying as close as possible to them. Right? And of course, I'm talking about, you know, we, we take a GPS and all that out of the equation, right? And you, you would stick as closely as you would be, have a commitment to stay close to them because you depend on them and you'd be grateful that you saw them. But that's the attitude that we should have with God. That we have this commitment to stay close to him through his word and through the church and through our, our fellowship and, and through our prayers. And we're committed to stay close because I need him. And I'm so grateful for what he's done. Amen. Right? I'm so grateful for what he's done in my life. So when we face these challenging situations, and they come, they, 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 they have come and they will come, we have to remind ourselves of God's ability. And so one of the things God tells them, he says, look, you're about to go, you're about to get victory, you're about to, you're about to defeat seven nations who are mightier than you. Right? So you know that they're stronger than you, you can't do it on your own, but you're going to get the victory because I'm going to give it to you. And so when we have difficulties, we have things that we're struggling with, we need to depend on God, and that means that sometimes we cry out to God repeatedly. Right? Paul said, I had this thorn in the flesh, and I cried out to the Lord three times. Right? Depending me, Lord, if you don't do it, it won't get done. And then we need to remember his power that nothing can hinder him. Nothing can hinder God. When, when God told um, Abraham that he, uh, Sarah was going to have this baby and they are old past childbearing bearing years, way past childbearing years, and Sarah laughed, you know, like, ha ha, Lord, you're going to give me the promise now I'm old, this or that. And God says in Genesis 18, 14, God asked the question, is anything too hard for the Lord? It's a rhetorical question where the answer is already built in. Of course not. Nothing is too hard for him. And so we need to keep that in mind. And God told him, in verse 2, he says, when, you, when the Lord God delivers you, and, you, and he says, I want you, to, I want you to smite him, I want you to make no covenant with him, and show him no mercy. Now covenants, you know, normally take the, the, the believer the way of the unbeliever. We make these binding agreements where we bind ourselves to other people's direction. And that's what God says. You don't bind yourself to a person's direction. Why would a, why would a, a person with sight bind themselves to follow a blind person? Are you with me? And that's the idea here. You have the sight. You are the light. You are the salt. You have to be the one that leads. If you if we go if you go link with me, then you're gonna go my direction. And if I we can't go my direction, those are the type of covenants shouldn't be made. Are y'all with me? 
Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship is righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion is light with darkness. There was an unequally, unequal connection and yoking. And this is a picture of those two oxen that are in this, in this yoke together and they're plowing together. And whoever is the dominant one, he will, his will will be imposed. And he says, you don't, you don't link yourself in a way where the, the will of someone who wants to go wrong will be imposed on you. Are oh, you with me? So you have to be careful of that. The safest way to do it is to, is to, is to link and, and with people who are like-minded. Amen? And then he says something here that's a little challenging to us. He says, I want you to show no mercy to them, right? I want you to go in there and I want you to just, just break stuff down and, you know, show no mercy. And sometimes when we see things like that in the Bible, it makes us cringe and people start um, getting er er erroneous in their doctrine to try to deliver God from bad press and bad publicity. But I say, let God be who he is, right? Oftentimes it's hard for us to see people as God sees them. Let's be real about that. Oftentimes it's hard for us to see, God, see people the way God sees them. Jesus had the ability to see people the way they were. The way they were. In, in Matthew 23, 20, 23, 33, when uh, those folks, the Pharisees came to Jesus, Jesus said, serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Some people were, were hailing them as, oh, great teacher, oh, great teacher. Here Jesus calls them snakes. Are you with me? Because he had the ability to see people for what they really, and we don't always have that ability. John the Baptist had it too. In uh, Matthew 3, 7, uh, when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, to them, same thing, huh? You snakes. Somebody, who don't want y'all snakes to uh, run? That ain't polit politically correct, right? But God has never tried to be politically, politi politically correct. He's going to be truthful. Are you with me? I think we should pray and ask God for this, to increase our discernment so that we can be able to divide and understand and, 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 and see things for what they really are. Because everybody and everything that presents itself as good and just and right and pure and holy is not. Let's be honest about that. But then we get pushed into, you know, this, this, um, this, this corner and bully to say that whatever you do, the great taboo of the world is to judge. Just don't judge. And, 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 and if you can't judge as a Christian, then you are a prey to the devil. Because Jesus says there will be false prophets. And if you can't make a judgment, then they will lead you astray. Yeah. Are you with me? No wonder Satan pushes that. The greatest sin and the taboo of the, of the world is judging. And the reality is that even when people say that, they don't mean judging. They mean critically judging or judging negatively. Positive judgments are accepted. You're a nice person. You got a good heart. Right? You, you know, you, you, you'll do for people. You're very kind. Nobody says, don't judge me. And we say, thank you. Right? But if you give critical judgments, that's when you have problems. Are you with me? We should pray and ask God to increase our discernment so that we can see, divide, and understand things for what they really are. Jonah 4, 11. When Jonah... <laughs> had um, followed God and then Jonah had that little tree he was under and it shriveled up and stuff like that and he was all sad because of the tree was, uh, died and God was trying to let God Jonah see that you, you crying behind this tree but they had people that you know human beings that I had pity on right and so God says and should I not pity Nineveh that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between right, their right hand and their left and much lives die. So what, I want to read that scripture to you to, just to show you that here was a case where they had people, God said these people could not discern between good and bad, between right and wrong, between evil and, you know, and good. They could not, they could not tell. And, and we need to ask God for discernment so we can, so we can be able to distinguish 
between what's good and what's bad, what's right and what's wrong, so that we can so that we can tell and divide and see the difference. There were a bunch of people that could not tell the difference between what's right and wrong. And we see that in our society. That there are people that have no discernment. Sometimes it's hard for us to recognize in this day and age who's on the Lord's side and who's not. And so God gives us some principles and some standards to apply when making those determinations. Two of those are found in Matthew 7, 16 and 1 Timothy chapter 5. Look what he says. And he says, you will know them by their fruit. Because we're so prone to, to, to be persuaded by, by good talk, uh, a big crowd, uh, you know, uh, an appearance of success. And Jesus says, no, let me give you something to go by. I know it, I know, I know it sounds good. You say, man, but they got, they got 500,000 people following them. They can't be wrong. We just saw that in the Bible there's 100 and some thousand people who couldn't have no discernment. So he says, you just apply simple standards to your life. He says, if somebody claims to be something, it's not hard. You will know them, but you, you know, you know, you'll know whatever they are. Forget about the claim. You'll know a person by the fruit that comes from that. They don't have to make a claim because everybody produces some type of fruit, good or bad. Are you with me? And then we get so excited sometimes, as, as uh, so excited, so desperate, I uh, call it, as Christians. Where the first person come along, and don't talk about if they're some kind of superstar, basketball player, or, you know, somebody famous, and they come and say, oh, I'm giving my life to Christ. Lord, we're going to put them in the pulpit that day. And God, and Paul tells Timothy, do not lay hands on anyone hastily. Lay hands on no man suddenly. Take your time and let people show you who they are. Oh, right. I hate it when the church acts so desperate, right? We know that we just we just desperate for people. Anybody, you know, oh Lord. Um, I remember I was at a program with that one time, and they had some teenagers. They were uh, had a little choir and they were singing, and the pastor got up and said, "Oh, this is a blessing. Look at that. They could have been out there praising the devil, singing for the world, and then not, but they singing for God. I want to stand up and say, but they were outside cussing a little while ago. They wasn't." I, was, I heard them. They were cussing up a storm. I told them, listen, I said, they're out there cussing up a storm and then getting up in there singing and then we, we, we all happy talking about they singing for the Lord. They ain't singing for no Lord. It was, the, the real them was on the outside. They're performing right now. They're putting on a show. The real them was out there when nobody was around. Oh, you hear what I'm saying? And so the Bible says, take your time. Slow your, slow your roll. Are you with me? We, ain't, we don't have to be desperate. We have to make God look desperate. Right? We, we plant, we water. He gives the increase. And if he's satisfied at the rate of increase, we should be satisfied and not being desperate. Making God look, we'd have been like, Jesus, you need more than 12 men, Jesus. Come on, Jesus, you need more than 12. Don't tell. When Jesus told the people, look, if y'all gonna follow me, you gotta eat my flesh and drink my blood. And many of them turned and walked away. They'd be like, Jesus, don't say that. We ain't worried about it. It's gonna be us 12. And Jesus looked at the 12 and said, y'all going to leave too? And Peter showed that, uh, that commitment and that understanding. <laughs> he said, where are we going to go? You got the words of eternal life. Are you with me? So, verses, um, we read verses 3 and 4. He says, um, you know, uh, make no marriages. Uh, you're gonna turn your son away from me. You know, he tells them, you know, don't don't connect, don't have no, uh, show no mercy to him. And I, um, along those lines, I think that the battles of the Old Testament are probably more telling of the end times than uh, or the end of the age than our time we live in, because it's hard for us, as I said, to distinguish, you know, who's good, who's bad, because you know. We, we, we grew up in a different time. In the Old Testament, they knew who were for them and they knew who were against them. It was pretty clear, you know, because they were warring people. They knew, you know, all these people here, the, the Hittites, the Gergeshites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, they knew, they knew, they, Israel knew who was on their side and who wasn't on their side because they come and fight you and come and war against you. It's a little harder for us. That's why Jesus says that, you know, you just let, let his reapers come and, and, and distinguish people and not for us to begin to, you know, kind of, you know people by their fruit, but you don't need to begin to, ah, no, ah, what you did? Ah, you know, I don't think you're the Christian. I'm going to get you out of here. He said, because you ain't up plucking up good people. 
you know, trying to, trying to do that. At the end of this world, there's gonna be a, there's gonna, there will be a war that will make it clear whose side everybody is on. That's, that's one of the things I think about. And so I was thinking about this and I was like, so I was reading Revelation chapter 19 and um, you read it sometimes from verses 11 to 21 and it talks about Jesus just riding on a white horse, right? And he's got this, you know, his, his vesture dipped in blood and on his thighs the word of the word of God. And he rides and he's got the armies of heaven uh, with him and he has... Um, the, the kings and the, and the people of the earth and the armies of the earth fight against him. And, of course, he wins. And so this picture tells us that at the end of the age that Jesus will ride out and that all of us, all of his saints, all of those who have been Christian throughout all the ages will ride behind him and with him. And everybody who has not been real will be on the other side coming against him. It will be very clear who's on the Lord's side and who's not. And I began to think about that and it's like, I got to be real because I want to be, I want to be riding with Jesus, right? I mean, it, it will be no room for fakeness at that point, you know. You will ride, on the, you will ride with who you ride with. And so we got to be real and, and sincere, right? Verse 5, he says, but you, you shall deal with them like this. You got to destroy their altars, break down their images, and uh, burn all of the uh, false religious stuff. Here's another challenge for us in our society, right? Because we are tempted to respect other people's religion. Isn't that right? Some people adopt that, that, that mantra. That, you know, that's, their, that's their position. You know, they think it's virtuous. You know, I respect other people's religion. Is it virtuous or is it not? What God says here is I have no respect for false religion. All right? I mean, come on, let's think about it. Jesus says that I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And then here comes along old Mr. Mormon or Mr. Jehovah's Witness or Mr. Islam and say, well, you know, they got another way. And now you're telling Theron Smith, who believes what Jesus said, that I'm supposed to respect that? But it's a lie. It's not true. It's a deception. I don't respect it. See, we have to learn how to love people, but we don't have to love the lies that people believe. Are you with me? I know this might be a little, a little upsetting to y'all, but I mean, uh, just truth anyhow. Don't worry about it. All right? Well, listen, let me, let me, let's put it in a little, uh, let's, let's bring it a little closer to home, okay? Your mama, your daddy, raised you, whoever, whoever, somebody, whoever raised you, grandma, whoever, raised you, nurtured you, took good care of you, provided for you, right? And then somewhere later in life, somebody comes along and say, I'm, your, I'm the one who really cared for you. I'm the one who really loved you. I'm the one who, you know, who, who really did all this for you. But you already know who, who loved you, who took care of you. Do you respect what they're saying? And if you crazy enough to respect it, I bet your mama won't. <laughs> right? Are you with me? You so, but I, I got to respect that because that's the claim they're making. Sometimes we think that we apply different standards because it's religion. Let me tell you something. Truth is truth and truth is good. Lies are lies and lies are bad. Whether you're lying about homework or religion. Whether it's truth about, you know, uh, 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 about, you know, doing something at the job or, you know, or something in church. Truth is good, lies or not. We respect truth. We don't respect lies. If somebody has fallen for a lie, we don't hate them because they've been deceived. We pity them. We pray for them. We talk to them. But we don't say, it's all right. You believe a lie. Are you with me? So God says, God says, I am the Lord. There's none like me. I'm the only God, none beside me. People got altars to other gods. God said, tear that down because it ain't real. And what people have told us is, don't tear it down, support it because everybody got a right to be wrong. <laughs> and catch that through there now, yeah. You see what I'm saying? We respect people, but we don't respect the lies that people believe. 
Besides that, I think that to give validity to a false religion or a false god is an indication that a person ain't convinced by the true God. Right? I don't know how in the world that I could respect uh, Joseph Smith's position or Charles Russell's position or uh, 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 Muhammad's position and believe with Jesus, that Jesus is the way. If I am convinced of Jesus, I mean, I'm sorry, that ain't, that ain't right. That ain't true. Right? And if I say what I give respect to it, I'm not really convinced of Jesus. Acts chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. Paul's going through the, uh, the Areopagus, Arap whatever it is, and he said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I'm proclaiming to you. Paul says, y'all got all kind of uh, religions that you created. I, ain't, I can't explain those to you because they're all false. But you say, oh, you got space here for a God. In case we, there's some God out there we don't know, let me tell you about him because he's going to be the real one. Are you with me? But you see the respect they had for all of these religions? Because there was no conviction about what was real. So they respected everything. When you have a conviction that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, anything that con con contradicts that, you will thumbs down and in a heartbeat. Yes. Say, uh, Auntie, I love you, you know, but, but, uh, but your position is wrong. Are you with me? I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I just, I'm just telling you what God, what God loves. The truth. So, you'd be surprised. Um, in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul told the Romans that men suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Right? He said they suppress the truth. You, the surprise, this is the thing that will surprise you. That when people suppress truth about God and, and, and who he is, the default position is not to return to atheism. There are atheists in the world, but atheists make up a small percent compared to religious people. The default position to suppressing the truth of God's holiness is to turn to religion and create a God of our own making. So here is God who's holy and righteous and you and I cannot live, make ourselves live up to a standard that he'll say, okay, that's good. You're in righteousness with me. And so what men do is they create religions where you can do that. They create religions. And you look at the religions that men have created, and every one of them has the same thing in common, that there's something you can do to earn a good standing with God. That, and suppressing the truth that, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that it is only through faith in Christ Jesus that we are granted righteousness. The religions of men try to suppress that. People, and everybody, like I said, people don't normally turn to atheism because deep inside people know that there's a creator. So we turn to religion and we create a religion and we find one that works for us. And I've told you in the past that before you find a religion that works for you, you better make sure it works for God. Because he is the judge. Are you with me? Amen. Verses 6, 6 and 8 through 8, he says, For you are a holy people unto the Lord your God. That's why he tells them they got to stand against that other stuff. He says, You are a holy people to the Lord your God. And that God has chosen you to be a special people to himself above all the people that are on the face of the earth. Do you see yourself like that? And as a Christian, you see, see yourself as special? See, so we, um, once again, we, we have these, we have these <laughs> built in, um, you know, taboos in our society. And, you know, we don't want to seem, I don't want to seem like I'm, you know, I ain't saying I'm nothing special. Well, then, okay, then you ain't a Christian. Because Christian's special. Amen. Right? Peter, Peter repeated this. Peter says, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. His own special people. Yes. Right? Glory. Now, I understand that me being special is not of my own making. It's not of my own, you know, I mean, I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't make this in myself, but he chose me. He tapped me. And what he did in me makes me, makes me special. And so I expect different. Yeah. And I also act different yeah. or differently. Are you with me? This is not a specialness that causes me to rise up and, and with a big head and get puffed up, but it causes me to fall down on my knees yeah. and worship. 
Because God did this. Amen. Are you with me? This morning we were uh, doing praise and worship and I just looked and thought about myself and, 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 and those of you in here. And I'm like, man, God saved us. He changed us. And I just thought for a second, like, what would we be like if God had not chosen us? Right? Where would and could be we be? God chose you. Right? He didn't, Lord, not set his love upon you or choose you because you were more in number. He didn't choose you for anything because of you. He chose you to keep his faithful promise to, to his, uh, his chosen people. He told Abraham, you go read Genesis 12, and he told Abraham, he says, I'm going to bless you, you to be a blessing. He said, and many nations of the earth are going to be blessed because of you. And God has kept his promise. Amen. He has blessed us because of his promise to Abraham. Amen. Thank you. Are you with me? Ephesians 1 4 says, He has chosen us in Him. Right after we start doing good, <laughs> when we get tired of doing bad, right? From the foundation, I'm sorry, before the foundation of the world, right? I always had a feeling, I don't know, even when I was a little kid, that something special was about me. <laughs> I know. I used to, I used to have dreams. I'm serious. I told him this. I used to have dreams, and <laughs> she gonna laugh. It's crazy. I used to have dreams, and I used to be fighting the devil, and I would be swinging from vines like Tarzan, because Tarzan used to come on a lot. He used to like Tarzan, and so I'd be swinging from a big vine on the mountain, fighting and kicking the devil and stuff like that. I've been special. Lord. For the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. Right. I didn't always live special. Amen. Lived like trash. But I was treasure. I was God, a treasured possession. Right? Yes. A treasure. You, look, nobody could ever reject, should ever be able to reject you again for anything and just break your, your heart and your spirit because God has chosen you. Yes. You are a treasured possession. Amen. Right? We are special to God. His own possession. That's why, you know, the Bible says that when people, he says, pray for those who, who despitefully use you and, and curse you and stuff like that. He says, you don't need to try to get them back. You need to pray for them because you God's special person. You need to first of all prove that you are God's special person and they need your prayers because they're messing with God's possession. Hmm. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 says, Having predestinated us unto adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Wow. Just like Israel, God didn't choose us because we were special, but him choosing us makes us special. Are you with me? 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. I put that on there, I thought he erased it. Oh, okay. Behold what man of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. <laughs> that sound? That we should be called. I, and every time I read that, I think about this great love that God has bestowed upon me, and then I think about stuff that I've done. Sins, just some of them, because I, I can't think about all of them, you know, praise the Lord. But uh, just think about some of the sins I've done. And I think that it took a lot of love for God to, to put upon me that this dude who was doing that stuff would now be called child of God. And I'm not talking about called the child of God by somebody out in the world, but by God. By God. Isn't that awesome? By choosing you, God makes you different. He chose you. And choosing you, he makes you different. Peter says you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We sang that song this morning, I can't stop praising his name. I just can't stop. That ought to be real. 
I thought about the little song that Ken Jones had years ago, uh, the professional, and he's he talking about praising, and he's talking about I'm a pro at it. He said, I come in with my hands lifted, yeah. right? I mean, that should be our attitude, our heart's attitude. We should be people who are always thankful that we are living out, you know, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, be thankful in everything, but this is the will, give thanks in everything, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. By choosing you, God makes you different. And if you are Christian, you have a different responsibility. You have a different urging from within. You have a responsibility to be different. Right? You have a, when God says, let your light shine, that's not a suggestion. That is a command. Right? And Jesus says, I don't give you light to put it under a bushel. Right? To hide it. Let your light shine so blind people can see. This light penetrates blindness. It did it for us. Verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God. Marie was praying this morning. I wanted to say, yeah! Right? Talking about how God is faithful, right? I mean, he is, he is so faithful. Yeah. He is the faithful God, which keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to one, two, three, four, five, six, say forever. Lord. A thousand generations it represents forever. Yes. Right? Still hope for your children. Hope for your grandchildren. Are you understand what I'm saying? Stay faithful. Walk with the Lord. You know that you're special. But be humble because you're special because he, he tapped you. Yeah. Because he chose you. Yeah. Without him, I understand what Jesus said. I believe it to my heart. That apart from me, you can do nothing. I have realized that. I know. I tell people in a minute that, look, I will take a good car and run it straight in a ditch. Right? And remember, guys. It takes humility to follow, to walk with God, especially when people are in your ears. And when I say in your ears, I don't mean just right in your ear talking, but I mean just in society with TVs and commercials and attitudes and everything that are telling you to, you know, to be different uh, in, that, in that bad way, to get yours, to, you know, to be puffed up. Don't let anybody you know, mess over you. You, know, you got to be humble to live out the Christian life. Right? But I want you to understand that God doesn't look for the great. He takes the humble and he makes them great. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Jesus says in Matthew 23, 11 and 12, but he who is greatest among you, you know what he's going to be? It's going to be the servant. That's going to be the one who's serving. That's who God says is going to end up being the greatest. He said, and whoever exalts himself will be humble. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's God's word. He is the faithful God. Faithful God keeping his covenant of mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Your treasured possession. Know it. Live like it. Be humble and pass those blessings on to your children, your children's children. And on down. Amen. Because God is faithful. I'll tell you one, one more thing before we go. Because sometimes we, we value only, I used, to, I, mean, I used to do it too. Like, if it didn't, you know, out here by, when I first started reading the Bible, like, man, Abraham, they're talking about I'm going to make you great, but he's dead now. You know? Because the tendency, I, well, I had the tendency to only value stuff as it pertained to this life, as though if it didn't happen here, it wasn't worth anything. And God is really saying, look, man, the real, the real value and worth of, of living is going to be in the next life. And when you think about it, we talked about it in the past, that there are people that you know from history, they have been gone on the other side longer than they spent on this side. So it makes sense. And I can remember thinking about um, when we first started the church, we had uh, Sister Dee Dee was coming to church with us for five years, and then she uh, uh, got, had cancer and she died. And she told Melissa, she said, boy, my mom would have loved to be able to see me, you know, living for God, walking with the Lord, you know, and I kind of feel like, oh man, too bad her mom couldn't see me. <laughs> what? You, you know what I'm saying? Right? I mean, you may not get to see it here, but he's faithful. Yes. 
right? And you can enjoy it forever in the next life. The faithfulness of God. Are you with me? Treasure possession. Know that you're special. Live special. Live humble. And pass those blessings on to your children, your children's children, and generations to come. Amen? Amen. Amen. We stop right here.